I'm thrilled to have Professor John Thomas here from Quinnipiac University, professor of law, I might add, with a guitar on his lap. Well, we all have our hobbies. We have our hobbies, and you also just wrote a book called The Kalamazoo Gals. Right. And I must tell you, this piqued my interest because I grew up in South Bend, Indiana, and I spent some time in Kalamazoo. So I said, let me see what this is all about. <laughs> and it's all about 70 gals who made some guitars for Gibson in the middle of World War II. That's right. Start the story. So in addition to teaching law and playing guitar, I'm also a freelance writer for music magazines. And when I have time, I sometimes go on the road. I went on the road with Jackson Brown for five weeks one oh, time. Oh, there's the name dropping, <laughs> Jackson Brown. I love that. So every, every Friday through Sunday would go, because I have a teaching job, but I would do that. So I do a lot of freelance writing in, in the music area. And at some point, and I don't know how this happened, I came across a photograph. And it just kind of stuck with me. It was a photograph of a bunch of women, about 70, in front of the Gibson Guitar Factory. Let's show that picture. There it is. There are the gals, about 70 gals. And you wondered, what are they doing there? You know, it looked to me about 1940s. I wasn't sure. I later found out that photograph was taken June 1944, 71 years ago. And there were no men in the photograph. In addition, I write about music and musicians, but I also write about musical instruments. I've actually come to view musical instruments as not just inanimate objects, but as repositories for cultural and personal history. And you're passionate about uh, guitars. Well, I, I claim I'm both a certified and certifiable guitar geek, yes. All right, well, we'll deal with that as, <laughs> as we continue to talk. Right. So 70 gals sitting outside this building in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and you're wondering, what are they doing? What are they doing? And there had been rumors that Gibson had made guitars during the war, but only a few. And they say rumors because the fellow who was the personnel director from the 1930s through the war, named Julius Belson, had written a history of the company called The Gibson Story, published in the 70s, in which he said, we didn't build any musical instruments during the war because we were doing wartime contracts. And like many industries in the country, Gibson converted to wartime contracts. It was the only company in the U.S. that won three E of Excellent Awards for serving the military. Of course, they had woodworking skills. They built pontoons for amphibious airplanes. They built the struts for support systems inside wings. And Gibson was early in electric guitars, amplified guitars. So Gibson had electronic skills. They could work on radio and sonar and radar and that kind of thing. So it made some sense. But there were these rumors that maybe Gibson made a few guitars. Maybe they made a few guitars. So I started thinking about this. If they made guitars, who made them? And why don't we know about them? And if they made guitars, why did the fellow who hired those women, the personnel director who wrote the company history, say we made no instruments. So it got a little bit of a mystery going. So the first thing I wanted to do was find out whether the company made guitars. Where did you go first? Well, where I went first is I called customer service at Gibson, and I worked my way all the way up to the president's office, and each time people politely said, we don't have those records, but if we did, we're a private company, we wouldn't show them to you. And I had almost given up. It was about a year and a half. Now, I do have other jobs and other projects. Yep. I'm not working full time. Like right? teaching, you know. Teaching a little law at sometimes. At University, right. right. Exactly. So you became an investigative reporter. I did. I did. I'm not, you know, with no skills or experience whatsoever. So I'm just stumbling along, fumbling through. And I keep asking about these records because there are, again, rumors in the guitar geek world, if you will. And I've almost given up, and I get an email from a publisher for whom I've written a lot of articles for a music magazine. So I know this nice person, Gibson, and why don't you contact him? So I do, and he says to me by email, I don't think we have that kind of thing, but I'll look around. And this is now the company headquarters in Nashville. 20 minutes later, maybe, I get an email back. I'm sitting here with an old, rusty, dusty, leather-bound book, opened up a page, and right here it says, on some date, 1938, we sent a guitar to Les Paul. We have a whole stack of these. Come on down whenever you want. So two days later, I was in Nashville with a little pocket camera to, to try to count these sure. uh, guitars. And so I took pictures of 4,400 pages of these shipping ledgers from 1936, the earliest I found, up through the war. And then, you know, someone had to do it, I counted them. And Gibson shipped almost 25,000 instruments during World War II. Why did they hide this? Was it because we were supposed to be doing wartime things and this would be frivolous? Why did they hire women to do this, kind of tucked away in a building? So I'm not sure. I have two theories. One the theory is it's during the war. Survival is a key. Uh, patriotism is the letter of the day. And it, building musical instruments might be seen as frivolous. 
Now I say that, but other guitar companies, Martin Guitar Company, the Gretsch Guitar Company, um, Steinway Pianos was still building pianos until the government shut them down, uh, companies that made musical instruments, uh, horns and such, not only did they continue to make them, but they got contracts because the military had bands. And in addition, the military itself bought guitars. So there may have been something to that, but I think the primary explanation is that Gibson was worried that the buying public, nearly all men, would not buy women-made guitars. And my evidence for this is I got a hold of all of the advertisement that Gibson did over the years. I scoured libraries, found collectors of you know, memorabilia and what have you, and the advertisements of the day said uniformly, we're not building any guitars until the boys come home. Always the boys. Interesting. So this is an all-female crew. Right. They build what is known as banner guitars, right. which are what? So this is another, uh, you know, a lot of this was just fortuitous. I kept stumbling, investigative reporter with no skills and no vision, just trying to find out more information. We're going to hire you, by the way, well, after this. Well, great. So. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> as long as we can do music stories. Yeah. Uh, so during the war, it turns out, of course, they did make guitars, and some almost 25,000 total musical instruments, you know, guitars, mandolins, banjos, that sort of thing. And during the war, this little golden banner went on to the top of the guitars. You get a shot of that. So it's right under the Gibson name. It's a little script. It's a, it's a, it's a silk screen banner uh -huh, that says right only a Gibson is good enough. So that made it a banner guitar. I named these banner guitars because it looks like a banner. And as fate would have it, that little banner slid onto this was called the headstock in early 1942 and disappeared in late 1945 exactly when the women were building guitars. So if I find a guitar with the banner, I know women's hands touched it. Now another interesting thing to me, and I, it's another little bit of information I used to assert my thesis, if you will, that the real reason for covering this up was because women were making the guitars. And that is that prior to the war and after the war, Gibson was the king of exaggeration. Every guitar was more beautiful than a southern bell. Its tone was more sonorous than the rippling brook. I mean, unbelievable. All of their advertisements, all of their catalogs, all of their press information was exaggeration. Except during World War II, when women made guitars, and suddenly Gibson was good enough. Right? So all of that hyperbole disappeared. But then so did the banner, the just good enough, disappeared when men came back. Women ceded their jobs back. They weren't fired, as best I can tell. They ceded their jobs to the men, and the company went on as it did. So I get a story, I get a mystery, and I get a marker for these instruments. I now know when I find one of these, and I'm the person to discover this because nobody else was dumb enough or crazy enough to do this, that these were women-made guitars. So you start trying to find these gals who are in their 80s and 90s. And right. what do you find? So that's, at first I find they actually made guitars, even though I just denied it. I found all this literature. Um, I hired a researcher to go to the National Archives to get every document that mentioned Gibson. I got 1,200, 1,300 pages, which of course I had to read. And then I needed to find one of these women. Now, I just got really lucky. I was guessing that this is a little slice of the demographic that didn't move much, right? stayed in one place, and they might still be around in Kalamazoo. Because if they had moved, I don't know how I would find them. Sure. I also know that this is not a slice of the demographic that spends a lot of time on Facebook and chat rooms. <laughs> I, I, I can't post somewhere, right. did you work at Gibson? Right. So I took out advertisements in the Kalamazoo Gazette and the little newspapers of the surrounding communities. I'm a professor in Connecticut. I'm coming to town on X day. I want to meet you if you worked at Gibson. It didn't specify man or woman, because at this time, I actually don't know whether those women were just, you know, it was Mother's Day standing in front of the factory, or they were working in the factory, what they were doing. I don't know yet, right, because I haven't met them. I'll be here if you worked at Gibson. And I got contacted. My goal was, my dream, my obsession, if you will, as my wife would have told you and will still tell you today, was to find one of those women in that picture. Sure. I found 12 of them. So 12 come forward, or did one of these gals say, I know so-and-so down the street, she's still here? Well, it was something like that, but it wasn't really the gals. It was either the gals' daughters or more often the gals' granddaughters. Mm. So I would get uh, either phone calls or email messages. My grandmother worked at the factory. She's really shy. I don't think she'll talk to you, but I'll try. Will you come? You know, I, I would like to do this because I don't know anything about her history. Maybe we can learn together about what my grandmother did. So it was really almost a family effort. I found 12 women and one man. So you took a little tape recorder? Well, I did. I, I went out first and I took digital gear. I just took audio gear the first time around. And you know, I didn't know what I had here. 
I wasn't sure. I hadn't talked to these women. You know, I just talked either very briefly to them or to their daughters or granddaughters, once in a while sons, but it was really kind of a, a female movement, if you will. And so I did not know what I was going to get. So I land in Kalamazoo, I visit these women, I record to digital audio so I can save the files and what have you. Sure. And I'm, you know, one day into this thinking, I found a piece of American history nobody knows about. You know, everybody knows, in my, this is my line now, everybody knew about Rosie the Riveter. Nobody knew about Laura the Luthier. And, and like you said, they made 25,000 guitars. Yeah, they made that incredible. they weren't making. That wait, they weren't wait. making. Very interesting. The first interview E tells you what? Well, so, I, so I, there were two, two categories of these women. Some of them gave me their address. I didn't have a GPS. I got Google Maps. I drove to their houses and I interviewed them. The smarter one said, okay, but I'll meet you in a well-lit public place. Cause I'm not For gonna coffee. Have, exactly. So I went to some homes, but I also hosted an afternoon Sunday tea, which turned out to be sort of a beautiful thing. How much thing. time did this take you? Well, I spent five years on this book, you know, off and on. I had other, um, my day job, as I call it, a professor job. But this I was write. the passion. This was the passion. So, and I, you know, I'm very, very lucky that I have this job and I work at an institution that supports my scholarship when it's interesting. So sure. I do a lot of work in music, I mean, in uh, law journals, medical journals, some music magazines, and some popular general interest uh, works like this or in the New York Times on occasion or what have you. And the university supported me, not financially, but you know, they, they liked the stuff. And so summers and weekends and holidays, I would take some of that time and go to Kalamazoo or to the National Archives or to Nashville or wherever this crazy little story took me. Um, was, so the first interview he tells you what? So I, I roll up to her, her um, house, and her name is Jenny Snow. And if the, the viewers look at the photograph, and they look at the front of the photograph, and count over, oh, five or six from the bottom right. All right, if you can do that real quick, the bottom right, just count you'll over. You'll see someone with a flower in her hair, and that was Jenny Snow. She always wore a flower in her hair, so she could pick herself out. And I drove up in my rental car to her house, gravel driveway. I can remember the tires to this moment and stopped the car and turned it off and said to myself, well, what am I going to do? I, you know, what am I doing here? I have no idea. So I sat there for a while, well, got my gear, and audio recording equipment, opened the door, and Jenny was standing in the doorway, then about 90, and said, I thought you'd never get out of that car. Come on in. So we walked in, and I found a window, not just to this little piece of history, but really to my own history, because my parents were of World War II generation, but as a teenager, I figured if they'd experienced it, how cool could it be? You know, I just didn't, I didn't inquire about these kinds of incredible experiences. So Jenny and the other women started telling me about life in the day, and it just opened up my own story, the story of our nation, the story of sort of personal survival. And I became just riveted by this notion that an ordinary life, well told, makes for an extraordinary tale. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, we've all, we, we, and that's what you do with your website, with, with your, a lot of your information. We've all read stories about famous artists or Nobel laureates, and it's great, but I can't relate to people who it's are It's getting Nobel under laureates. the hood of under, that story. Right. What did she tell you about the factory? Well, she told me um, that it was just a crummy job. That was her word. I don't know why you care. It was a crummy job. You know, I, and like nine of the 12 women, after we talked for a little while, she said, well, I got a little something here you should see. Walked to the back room and brought out a box of memorabilia. I mean, it was as though she knew someday someone might care. So she had photographs, newspaper clippings, wire cutters for strings, a few sets of strings. It's in the book. It's in the book. Um, she told me that her husband, who had predeceased her, her husband said it was her duty to, um, to take a few things from work. And uh, appropriate was his word. And he worked for the telephone company. So I happen to know if you're ever in need for a 1940s telephone, I know where several hundred are in a garage somewhere in Michigan. I might need <laughs> something, so that's great. So you start, you, you tell the story of these guitars. Right. This one is from that era. Tell me about this guitar. So this guitar shipped June 23, 1943. And as we sit here and talk, it is June 23, 2015. So it's 72 years old today. It um, looks beautiful. It is a beautiful guitar. This came to me from the nephew of the original owner. And that's how I know when it shipped because he had records from where it was purchased, so I could see where it was purchased. And Did you it, buy this in Kalamazoo? Uh, no, I bought this like I buy all my instruments through the internet. But you know it was built by one of those gals. Well, I did because at this point in time I've identified that banner, right? I know it's got the little banner on it. So, and I have, I have several of these guitars now. Um, and what, they would come to me, people would identify it, and I would say, I'll buy it, but here's how I'll buy it. We'll have it appraised, 
by a professional appraiser at a well-known guitar shop so that I pay its value. And I'll either pay that value or not. I'm not going to negotiate with you because I'm the person who knows them. I just don't want to take advantage of some mom and pop or some mm -hmm. grandmother who sells it to me for a few hundred dollars. I wouldn't do that. So I get it appraised, and then I just pay the appraisal rate, which is... What you know. do these go for? Well, this is probably about $5,000 now. $5,000? The, 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 the bigger, the better in guitar world. So the, the, the slightly more um, desirable ones would go for maybe $30,000. Um, and I know I should have invested heavily because the book has helped with the market value of Bander Gibsons. Well, let's hear a little <laughs> bit of this because you're a guitar player along with everything else that you do. Okay. So let's hear a little something. <laughs> Professor, what have you learned by writing this first book? What, because I'm drawn to this. I love vintage. I love yesteryear. It's about stories. If we don't learn about our past, how do we go to the future? I think that's right. And I think what I've learned is that my passion, not just music, but my passion is for what I call ground level history. I've, I've fallen in love with the form of oral history. And I don't just reproduce transcripts, I weave it into a non-fiction narrative because I also like story, so I want to produce my own story. But I've fallen in love with the, the, the story of just ordinary people because nobody's really just ordinary. And this generation's amazing. What did I ask them? What was so easy? What are your first memories? Well, growing up during the Depression, I had no food. We had, we, you know, we had to make our own shoes and we never complained. Where were you December 7th, 1941? I knew that. You know, what are your greatest memories of life? My children, my marriage, victory over Europe, victory during the war day, 9-11. Uh, really, the, you know, so that not just the creation of the internet, but this generation really came to life before radio was popular. Not even everybody had radio, and they saw television, the internet, 9-11. You know, it's so incredible transformations. And from my perspective, seeing that through the eyes of someone who was just trying to survive, feed their children or their younger siblings, just get through the world, get through the war. No whining. No one complained about anything. Um, I know uh, Peter Jennings had the notion that it was the, uh, the greatest generation. And I thought, well, uh, yeah, we all think we're the greatest generation. I'm now completely convinced that it's the greatest generation. The people of that generation saw a change in mm. history, a change in you know, the course of human, human existence uh, in a way that probably most of us will not. And so I fell in love with that. Um, I really want to do that. My next book will be another oral history book. You're ready to do this again after, after uh, this I'm, took you five years? I'm it's, on it. It's a tough thing to do. Well, the next one will be about people who've lived along the U.S.-Mexico border, and I'll be living in Mexico most of the fall, practicing my Spanish to interview people who lived there a long time, mainly ranching and mining families, because if I can talk to the grandparents, and they can remember their grandparents, I get about 100 years of history. And again, the same kind of thing. I want to, and this, this, this is a different place, but really hard challenges. And I just have fallen in love with this notion of how people live their lives. I just really want to learn about that. And again, I learn about myself. I learn about our own country. I learn about just humanity. Well, it's a great little book. Well, All these you. vignettes that you've uncovered. Nobody knew about this, but you That's found right. it. The Kalamazoo Gals. Professor John Thomas, thanks so much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. Spend all night kissing and it wobbles right here Then who else is missing? Got a little sidetrack to find my solution And find the keys to the door But it's also a metaphor Need to keep on to the grocery store of a mind Just to save time Skip right ahead to the last ride The harder we look, the 